Hello, can everyone hear us? We push our buttons and follow our directions. Wonderful. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And I must say, this is a great honor for me to be sitting next to Susan Crawford. Um, so very excited for the conversation tonight. Just a quick overview before we jump in. Our goal is to have uh, cover a, a number of topics um, here together and then open up to you all in the audience. So please be thinking of questions. I know um, you likely came with many for Susan. Um, so where to start? Susan. I, you know, I, um, I have to say, I selfishly am going to ask the first question for my purposes. <laughs> and, and I think back to uh, my work as the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer of New York. And on day one was really charged with mapping the first ever tech policy portfolio mm. for the state. Mm -hmm. At the time, still many would argue today, there isn't really a, a, an agenda or a defined set of issues that qualify as tech policy at the federal or state level. You today have actually um, put many of those issues on the map. If you had the same charge today in 2019 coming into a similar role, what would you put on the agenda for a tech policy portfolio? Well, thanks, Kristen, and thanks to Harvard, and thanks to the Amazon guys. I just want to admire a couple of things. The balletic operations of the Steadicam <laughs> operator, which I'm really enjoying. It's great. And also the fact that Felix, which is this wonderful restaurant, is two doors down. So enjoy that after the networking is over. Um, we're at a dramatic time in tech policy in the United States. A lot of the action is happening actually locally. And I've had the great joy of traveling around the country talking to people in very scrappy cities who are really concerned about a very basic issue for the country, which is that when it comes to just being able to work with data, we're leaving half the country behind, Absolutely. according to Microsoft. That's, those are their figures. They say FCC says, oh, it's available to everybody, but that's very optimistic and depends on horrible data self-reported mm. by the carriers. And uh, when you look at who's actually using the internet at acceptable capacity and speeds, it's half of America. And as we look at these carefully placed companies who are using AWS, look at all, no, none of the names overlap any of the other names, which is brilliant for branding. <laughs> but, you know, they all need terrific connectivity too. And only half the businesses in New York City have gigabit access here at a time when 100% of Chinese businesses are going to have it. And only uh, two-thirds of New Yorkers even have a connection at home, which is just horrendous. It's, it's horrifying. Right. So my big effort in policy these days is to get, just get this on the screen. Like, not forget about this, because it's as basic as the dirty water in Flint, as uh, not having adequate electricity. It's colliding with lots of other issues for the country. How are we doing on health care? What's going on with education? How are we going to cope with climate change? The essential substrate for every single one of those issues is a terrific, resilient, ubiquitous, cheap, available, persistent data connection for everybody in America. And we haven't even begun to work towards that, except on the local level. I went to talk to the um, the mayor's group, uh, National League of Cities in Washington just a couple of weeks ago, and they're all interested in this. And there's tremendous energy at the local level everywhere. Right. But it's so easy for uh, short-term politi pol political officials not to take this on. And we, you and I have already talked about one right. who didn't take it on with enormous energy, who was pretty close to home. And uh, that's happened across the country. The problem is we're now suffering from a dramatic digital divide, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, in pretty short order, where they plan to have 80% of their citizens connected to fiber optic lines. And the entire Belt Road Initiative, which is going to touch 80-plus countries, 65% of the world's population, 40% of the, of the world's GDP, that is all underscored by fiber. That's just the plan. That's how it's all going to work. And we don't have much to offer except charm. <laughs> we got plenty, but the problem is that that makes us roam in the modern world. You know, great to look at, really fun to visit, but not necessarily the place where new things will be born, new businesses will come to life. So, so there you are. For me, that's a really big issue, and it 
drives a lot of other issues. Uh, sort of literacy about data comes next, I think, and education, the severe gender gaps that you're very well aware of with all of your work right. with your Girls Who Code, a co-founder, right? Yes. It's a wonderful program and gets many women, young women involved, but we've got a very long way to go, and we're just sort of tending towards irrelevance. And how could that be? We're America. Right. How could that be? So, you know, it, this seems so basic. It right? is. This seems so basic, and yeah. it sounds like an issue that everyone can know, understand, and, and care deeply about. Right. We should connect our communities to the internet. That mm -hmm. does not feel like something we need to advocate mm -hmm. for in 2019, but it is. How do, we, how do we start talking about this in a way that this is top of the list on all policymakers' lips, yeah. that this is part of our regular discourse, that we know and understand the implications of, of uh, the lack of connectivity. How do we start uh, having a real meaningful conversation around this? I appreciate the question. I'm good at lots of things, but I suck at self-promotion. And <laughs> one, uh, I wrote a book, it's called Fiber, and it's actually very approachable, and it does explain how we got to this place. Unfortunately, it's too expensive, it's 30 bucks a copy, I would send a PDF to anybody who asked. I, I really want to get the ideas out there. If you're connected to a campaign, I would love it if you would help me yes. get, get the ideas to them. It's just so basic. It's not rocket science, but it depends on having a long-term view right. and not being put off by the attack which will come from some very, very successful and uh, sometimes well-loved, sometimes hated companies. There are only about five of them. It's Verizon, AT&T, Comcast, Spectrum, and CenturyLink. They really dominate internet access in America, but they are without any oversight or competition, so life is great for them, right. not great for the rest of us. But their, even their existence on the scene makes it difficult for political officials to take this on without really understanding the depth of the issue, and there's a tremendous amount of confusion out there. So if more people read this book, Right. That would help. If I could place an op-ed of the New York Times, that would help. I really tried, but <laughs> you've got so many issues they're working on right now that this is not, not well, one they're looking at. And that's so at. telling. That's yeah. so telling that this is not an easy placement no. on the op-ed pages, right? No, it it not. feels so urgent. Let's talk about what this means on the ground. Let's, yeah. We are in the great city of New York. Yeah. Um, let's talk about what this means on the ground, how localities across the country are dealing with this, um, and, and mayors or other leaders that have tackled this head on. What's, what's happening? Well, there's a lot of activity. There are 800 places, communities, co-ops, small places, big places, not a big enough city yet, but lots of places in the United States that are taking their destiny into their own hands and calling for the creation of a fiber network of some kind that, and my favorite model for this is an open fiber network. That is, the city is just providing infrastructure, a public work. It's just like a street grid. And the city is not itself selling internet access, which carries with it all kinds of privacy and surveillance bugaboos. Right. But just making it possible for lots of retail competition to emerge to serve everybody with vibrantly low prices and great connectivity. And there are lots of places that are doing this or are encountering the obstacles out there and powering through them. It's a wonderfully cooperative group. It's a little small bore. I'm looking for a big city to do this. San Francisco got pretty close, but then Mayor Lee died, um, and he was really carrying the flag for it. Mm -hmm. And the current mayor, it's not a priority for her. New York, it has not been a priority for either Mayor Bloomberg or Mr. de Blasio, and so we haven't seen real progress in this city. Right. Good for de Blasio for suing Verizon for not coming up with fiber, and, but what happened to that lawsuit? It's been two years. What's going on? So, um, but not much activity here, but I'm hoping that a Chicago or a San Francisco is gonna take this on, and then gradually that shames the federal government right. into activity. Right. We are replicating exactly the same pattern we saw for electricity. We did this with electricity. Completely private and served only a few areas, rich houses and uh, businesses first, very gradually poorer places, and then really gradually rural areas. So 90% of farmers didn't have electricity in 1930. Most people don't know this. Wow. Uh, but it was a completely private enterprise controlled by just a handful of companies. And so, 
FDR shows up, he cares about the issue, right. it changes the picture. Right. Um, but it started, the turnaround char started with small places in, in, in the United States. Um, so much to be done. So um, much to be done. But, but I think hopeful that we have leaders on the ground who are willing to take this on. Let's talk about a not so small place. You touched on China a bit. Yep. What's, what's happening? What's their approach? And what should we be prepared for? Well, really, the word's massive. Right. What do you want to say? Massive, overwhelming, uh, completely focused industrial policy aimed at creating a giant middle class that is able to communicate without even thinking about it and lots of advanced manufacturing, uh, it's sort of unlimited energy focus in this direction. It ties to lots of things that China does, high-speed rail. Right. We can't even build 200 miles of high-speed rail in California, it keeps getting stopped. But at the same time, uh, China's building tens of thousands of miles of high-speed right. rail to connect right. to everything, and new cities are springing up right and left. And I tell you, this Belt Road Initiative is a really big deal because that's How all... Many of you have heard, read heard about, about the Belt Road Initiative? Yeah, you've heard of it. Okay. So it's, it's large, and it's all about infrastructure creating, in effect, a, a debt trap for countries that bring China in. Right. Eventually, they will control ports and infrastructure across the world. So that, that's a giant global market for them. And it's not just the transmission of data. Right. This carries with it the ability to say which applications will ride on that network, what data will be drawn from those applications, and then what analytics or AI will be applied to that data. Think about all the insights that that gives a country. You could, you could say this is all about surveillance, but it's it's very largely about economic growth and prosperity as well. In response, we've got, we're America. <laughs> right. Right? We're special. Right. And we have been special, but we've been special because of a tradition of investing in federal research and development. That's why we have the internet in the first place and putting a lot of uh, zeal behind uh, education of computer scientists. And we've sort of forgotten those lessons we couldn't even start the Federal Reserve today if we thought about it. Did you know that at the time of the Civil War, there were 8,000 forms of currency around the United States? And every state regulated their own banks. Bankers were in charge, doing whatever they wanted to do. When there was a panic, which happened often, the very big banks in New York and Chicago were putting all their extra money in the stock market. So when the system began to freeze, Everybody got wiped out. And in 1907, J.P. Morgan steps up and rescues the country, right? And there were some wise people looking around the world and saying, wait a minute, there are central banks in these other places, and that seems to smooth out the availability of credit and cash, and why can't we follow one of those models? Right. And we did it, but it was a huge political battle, and we couldn't do that today. If someone said, you know, those Europeans, they've got an idea. Why can't we do that? We're incapable, apparently, of looking around. Uh, what I like about this internet access story, when it catches on, and I know it will, is that there really are countries that are doing a better job, and some of them are in Northern Europe. Um, and we will look to them right. and learn some lessons, and I hope make some advances. I don't want to slag Mr. Bloomberg and Mr. de Blasio too much. They have done some great things in New York, and we should, we should dwell on them. I think, I think a huge thing that Bloomberg did was Cornell Tech. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrific project, yeah. and it's gonna take 20 years to play out on Roosevelt Island. It helped that he gave $100 million of his own money to get the whole thing launched, but it's a really good plan. Absolutely. That's terrific. And with de Blasio, a really good plan was, um, you may have forgotten this, but in 2014, when he first came in, he got 40,000 four-year-olds into pre-kindergarten in six months. It was basically a miracle. And he put... It was an It was a miracle. miracle, but he did it, and he had every agency of the New York City government working on it. And that's the kind of planning right. that is actually like a tech policy planning. We're going to make sure everybody's literate and has Absolutely. a good education, and part of that is going to be software as well. Absolutely. You know, I think um, a lot of this requires big and bold leadership. Right. Um, and it requires a, a population and a demographic that 
cares about this, that's mm -hmm. talking about this, that's advocating for this, that is making uh, policymakers aware of and hold them accountable to right. what's happening on the ground. Um, I think it also requires, though, a, it's kind of an intuitive and structural sense that there's a difference between the public sector right. and the private sector. Right. The reason the Federal Reserve is governed by the public sector and not by the banks is that these two sectors have different incentives. Absolutely. So it's, it's not just sort of being vaguely aware we got to do something and then hoping that the private sector is going to take care of it. When it comes to these really basic long-term plans, there actually is no substitute for government, talented government, right. well-funded government, right. government with a lot of people who understand data and technology in it, right. like you, to take into account these, these very long-term strategies that are so required. It, you know, it's funny, I, I often think about the Zuckerberg hearings, which uh, now feel like a distant memory, yeah. but sort of a, a real moment and awakening for people like us, that, mm -hmm. that those folks um, on the ground in the nation's capital have zero understanding of how mm -hmm. the world works, how the internet works, how yeah. uh, the difference between, the difference in incentives <laughs> between yeah. the private sector and public <laughs> sector. Right. Um, what is it gonna take at the federal level? What is it gonna take to have a, a meaningful discourse uh, on this issue? Well, we only have a federal highway system because when Eisenhower was a young guy, just out of World War I, he rode in a convoy of cars and trucks across the United States. And it took two months because the roads were so awful. They kept getting stuck in the mud and falling over and things happened. His visceral sense that a highway system would be a good idea is the reason we have one. Right. We need, and Lincoln similarly really cared about railroads. He'd been a railroad lawyer, understood it. That's why we had a transcontinental railway. We need someone, and here I guess I'm gonna plug Mayor Pete because he seems like the candidate who gets this. Um, someone who really has a visceral level understanding of the relevance and importance, uh, not just as a ministerial matter to carry out policy, but sure. actually the centrality of right. tech right. to ensuring that we thrive in the 21st century. Um, that in fact government is responsive to the needs of the people, that we understand what government's doing. There's so much that technology can do. Right. So we need to find that person and they're bubbling up. There's so many retirements, by the way, guys, in uh, local and national level government. All young people should consider working for government at yes. some point during their career. Don't have to do it forever, but at some point, that's my mission in life, yes. is to persuade more people to do this. And then gradually, and then people have to die <laughs> so that they get out of the way, so that younger people show up and are, resp and are at the table responsible for making these decisions. There's your, there's your call to action. Absolutely. Uh, th this actually dovetails nicely with, with my next question, which is who are those people we should be following, we should be yeah. talking to, we should be giving platforms? Mayor Pete, great example. Feels like it, yeah. Who, who besides you? We all know know your work. Besides, well. that's ridiculous. Who besides <laughs> me? But truly, who yeah. should we be following? Who should we be talking about? Oh, there are people like me everywhere, everywhere in every city. There are. Uh, you just need to give them more of a platform. Right, right. People who are good communicators, literate in all this stuff. Right. Uh, don't take themselves too seriously, right. and are able to communicate across boundaries and. Here's a plug for the Ford Foundation and the, Knight, the whole bunch of foundations. Knight, Ford. Started off uh, something called public interest technology. It's just branding really exists in universities across the country and community college, by the way. Right. This is not the province of universities. But ensuring that people are cross-trained in the deep reasons that we have democracy and uh, we care about equity and justice and technology and are able to carry those skills into government, that's happening everywhere in the country. We just need to celebrate it more, pay attention to it, and not just celebrate the person who raises, I mean, Uber, $100 billion and no profit. <laughs> right. We celebrate that for some reason, and yet actually it's a cataclysm for American cities, just to veer off here for a second. Let's not, not celebrate all. that. Let's celebrate, you know, the person who's making terrific you know, policy for cities and the nation right. using technology. Like the heroes who saved healthcare.gov. How about yes. them? They can be heroes. Yes, absolutely. They're I use great. that story all the time. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, 
we're going to jump into Q&A, oh, uh, in part because I know many of you have burning questions. But before I do, just a quick show of hands. Uh, most of you work in the tech sector, is that fair? How many, raise your hands. How many people work? Yeah, there's some. Be good. How, many you, how many of you have ever considered working in the public sector? Yay! Right. Great. Good, good, good. I love Do saying it. that, even yeah. more than, than raise their hands for working in the space. Yeah, that's good. Um, so let's, let's open up to questions. Absolutely. Where do we start? Yes, front row always gets first. Yeah. I see a, I see a seal, sir, on your sweatshirt. What does it stand for? Uh, it's uh, uh, FBI. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. This wanted everybody to, to know. Yeah. <laughs> What's your name? Um, <laughs> I wonder if uh, 5G addresses some of the concerns you have about access. Yeah. Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, you've advocated that the industry should be regulated, or you what? But you don't go into detail about that. Is that federal regulation? Do you expect that it should be the states? Uh, and then finally, why wouldn't it be possible for entities that want this high-speed, the top-quality high-speed internet access, to work with the incumbents to say, here's a bunch of money. Please, you know, if they wouldn't install the fiber themselves, yeah. install it and buy down the rate so that they could uh, get, get the access cheaper for their customers rather than having separate systems. Terrific. I really appreciate the questions. Uh, 5G, a lot of hype, way up on the hype cycle. Um, three things. First of all, absolutely depends on fiber everywhere. You can't have this very high capacity wireless communication without fiber very, very close. And I mean really close to homes and businesses. And second thing, Wall Street, especially uh, Craig Moffat, has reverse engineered the prices, the expense of getting 5G installed by Verizon. And they're finding it's really expensive because these small cells that are going to be put up have to be very dense, connected to fiber, and then the signals are shy. They don't penetrate walls or windows uh, because they're moving so quickly. That's not their business. And so Verizon actually has to punch then a wire through the wall of a business or house in order to have a hotspot connected so that it can receive 5G. So it's all, it's expensive, and it looks like it's, Wall Street, third thing, is being told that the, business case for 5G is a premium service. That is a smart city service that you're going to charge a lot to cities to provide. Verizon, that's their right. business model. They are not aiming at serving the underserved for a low price. That's not the model because it's so expensive to install. It's not going to be a replacement for fiber. It's not. And particularly, what really galls me is the talk about 5G in rural areas, which is like myth piled on myth. Uh, you, can't, ah, you, you can't have 5G without fiber. You'd have to have cells very densely in rural areas. And the whole point, the reason they're not being served now is that it's expensive to run the wire there. So why 5G is going to fix that problem is beyond me. I only recently got interested in this, and I'm still feeling a little freaked out about being interested in it, but there might be significant health effects from 5G, mm. too, because the Transmitters are going to be, and every, all the gear is going to be so close to us, and nobody seems to be studying this. And there are a bunch of scientists around the world, more than 200, who wrote to the European Union saying, please slow down on 5G without knowing what it does to human beings. Even if we don't get heated up by 5G, there could be non-heat-related harms to human beings that are chart caused by it. Sure. But then I worry that I'm being too tin hat about this. Uh, I wish somebody could do some work on this, Senator Blumenthal mm -hmm. asked a really good question of the carriers at a recent hearing saying, what's the science on 5G? And the, the industry said, we're not studying it. And the, Senator Blumenthal said, so basically we're flying blind. And the industry said, yep. So that doesn't feel good to me, and I just worry about it. And I also worry that as soon as you mention this, you get attacked. Oh, by the way, no clients, no consulting arrangements. I'm clean. Ugh. It's, it's a rough world out there. Um, so those, those, that's my speech about 5G. Not going to replace it. As for working with the incumbents, a lot of these communities have tried that. Look, these are companies with investors who are looking for a particular profile of return, which is a very high rate of return over a very short period of time. 
That's why Google pulled out of this business, because installing fiber didn't fit their investors' profile. The company may have been interested in it, but their investors weren't, their shareholders weren't. That's, it's a great investment if you're a, a pension fund looking for five or six percent right. per return until the sun explodes. But the incumbents have no particular incentive to work with anybody. They face no competition and no oversight, so why bother? Um, so yes, there should be, this, this should be a utility and uh, we should provide incentives for companies to become retail operators on top of this wholesale network. Uh, we should provide tax incentives and other incentives to stop companies from, it's called sweating copper, keeping their copper lines in business forever and just making money from them and give them incentives to dig it up and, and use the fiber. There are all kinds of things we could do. I think actually the Federal Reserve would be a really interesting mm. regional way of uh, lowering the cost of capital for new wholesale open access dark fiber networks across the country. There are lots of levers we could pull, and right now we're not pulling any of them, except cities desperately trying to control their rights of way and avoid them being privatized right. and putting in dark fiber. So. Sorry for the long answer, but it was a dense and interesting question from an FBI sealed person. <laughs> Another question? Yeah, right there. Can you elaborate on how you think? Oh, oh, the mic. Sorry, sorry. Coming up. Oh, there's one way in the back. I'm so sorry. I'm not in control. I'll get it back to you. Yes. Hi, I'm Kaija. Um, you spoke about China earlier and the massive yeah. development that's occurring there. One could attribute that massive development to data collection and lack of privacy concerns. How would you say that moving to the Western society, how we're gonna emulate uh, similar uh, technology development without the uh, same views on right. <laughs> privacy? What a beautiful question. Uh, policy shouldn't emerge just randomly because a company decides what they're going to do. The whole point is to have a beating heart of human concern about human rights and agency and autonomy and all that at the heart of our policy-making apparatus. That's why we need people who understand both data and ethics mm -hmm. and justice working on this stuff. Mm -hmm. Because the whole point of what I'm yelling about is to have a Western response to what China is doing. They, they are able to uh, see everything, understand everything, and have no concerns about what effect that has on anybody. To be a gross overstatement, I think that seems to be true, and we should, and we should have a better model. Uh, you know, who gets to keep data? How is it, get, how is it used? For how long? Um, do you ever get to be forgotten after a while? There's so many burning policy questions that of course we have to deal with. But we also have to have the in infrastructure in place to allow us to communicate and build markets the same way China is. So, great question. Absolutely. Yeah. My question was if you could elaborate on the, the ways that government might fund the fiber uh, expansion that you're talking about yeah. in an area when many are concerned about taxes and the other competing uses of our resources, what are some ways that you would most like to see that financing happen? Terrific. Well, one thing I love about this issue is that two-thirds of Americans, regardless of party, think that the government should be involved. This is a totally bipartisan, non-polarized issue. Most of these 800 places are actually in Republican areas, mm. and people are willing to be taxed to make sure that there is great infrastructure in place. They, when they see its value, it's actually cheaper to put in a fiber network for tens of miles than it is to build a 15-mile piece of highway or a bridge. It, it's actually a very cost-effective public work, and that's all it is, a public work. So actually, if people understood how much the entire country is being taxed by about five Companies, we've got, you know, people say, oh, it's the private sector, free competition on the one hand, or socialism on the other hand, which is bizarre. We've got this weird world of a series of private governments. That they're taxing us, but only for their own benefit. So, in fact, I think that Americans, if they uh, got a grasp of this issue, would be very willing to put this way up on the list of important projects. We've got a lot, uh, but if we want to educate people better, get them world-class health care, all of that depends on having this infrastructure in place. Yeah. Great question. Maybe Great back question. here? Perfect. 
Fifteen. Uh, satellite connectivity. Does it play a role? The Dish Sunlight network? Foundation. Satellite. Satellite. Uh, Dish network. I mean, yeah. is that is that relevant at all, or should we forget about that ah. and, and focus on fiber? Thank you for the question. The the weakness of satellite is also its strength. It's up twenty two thousand miles in the air. So that's why Direct and Dish can cover half the United States with one satellite. That's terrific. The problem is, uh, for there's a lot of delay involved in traveling all those tens of thousands of miles, especially back and forth. So people who have to rely on satellite in America, to, for they pay companies like Hughes and Viasat and others, they pay a lot for internet access, and it's because there's no other option where they are. Usually, that's the only reason you depend on satellite. Right. There's nothing else around. Because of the delay, the caps on data you're about to use, those are the two big things, and the expense, those three things. Now, in developing countries where there's absolutely nothing, and Puerto Rico right now is one of those places, floating balloons and providing Wi-Fi that way is a, just a way to get a drip of water to people who are thirsty, but it is nothing compared to the 15-mile-wide river of data that should be in everybody's household. Great question. We have time for two more. Kristen, you're so exact. I love well, that. Well, and, and now I have to choose. Let's start right here and go to the very back here. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. Great. So um, thank you so much for coming to talk Absolutely. With us, Professor Crawford. Uh, you mentioned earlier that smart cities are another hotly touted topic. And yes. I had a question about how there's a lot of promise in, in any conversation about smart cities, like real-time monitoring of city functions and even mm -hmm. health benefits attached to them. But um, I've also read about how a lot of civilians, like those in Toronto, are pushing back to smart right. cities because of data collection and various question. other reasons. So I'm wondering, like, besides, obviously, data collection and surveillance, what are some other really big um, like watchouts or pitfalls or concerns that we as informed civilians should be aware of if our local government is like, you know, we, we want to do some smart city stuff? Right. How do can we I, make can I add a choices? question to that? Because I yeah. think that, that's such an important topic. What is a smart city? Well, um, so a bunch of big companies were looking for new services to sell about 15 years ago, and they started talking about smart cities. And one person told me at, at one point that smart stands for simplistic, mechanistic, ahistorical, reductive, and tautological. That, <laughs> so there you are. Um, because actually, uh, absent that beating policy heart at the you know, behind what you're doing, which is behind my answer to many of these questions. Right. It's just sort of instrumenting the city and pretending that that's going to solve enormous social problems, it, which is just not true. And in fact, can amplify and entrench social problems without that policy beating heart. Like right. surveilling poor people more than richer people because that's where you're targeting your efforts. It me makes people feel as if they don't have a agency or autonomy. The Toronto project in particular uh, has really caused Google some headaches because what happened was uh, Toronto, uh, an economic development corporation associated with the city of Toronto, signed an agreement in secret with Google to develop part of their waterfront. And it sounded as if it was going to be development from soup to nuts, where Google would be collecting all data of everybody wandering by, by the way, same thing with Hudson Yards, exactly the same thing. Um, and then use that to target services, right? Google said, well, we won't sell that data and the city can have it, but, but Google can use that data to enrich its knowledge about you if you are using any other Google service and just weave the whole thing together and then resell the entire package to other cities around the world. So there's been a good deal of freak out in Toronto and they're, they're backing off at this point. The promise looks great. You should see the sketches of this waterfront. It's like gleaming and blossoming and full of life. Right. But the question, the reason the question is so important is that we should never assume that absent a strong policy hand in government that you'll end up with a good result for citizens. The whole point is that these are government contractors or should be working for the city in service of city goals. Instead, because of the hollowing out of government that's happened over the last 40 years, ever since Mr. Reagan, 35 years, Mr. Reagan said, government's the problem. It's been awful, and so these cities get rolled often by tech companies that just say, We're, we'll sell you all this stuff and you'll love it, but it's not clear it's in everybody's interest. So there are great, promise, great promises in things like 
managing uh, energy use, understanding where water is being wasted, uh, understanding traffic flows, counting cars so that you can run traffic more effectively. And I applaud the city of Chicago for what they call the array of things. It's oh, yes. a set of public sensors that are picking up, it's essentially a Fitbit for the center, city, not picking up personal information, but information about the environment, air quality, traffic, things that a city wants to know. That data is automatically made public and available to all researchers who want to understand the city as well. And if the public gets worried about any one of those sensors, they'll be taken out. That's really smart. That's truly smart. Absolutely. And informed deeply by the city, uh, the University of Chicago's involvement. So far, New York City has not really gone in this direction. And Hudson Yards, I think someone's going to be writing an expose about that at some point. Very soon. Very soon. I, I would simply add to that that, you know, I think the, the debate around the Toronto investment has been extremely healthy mm -hmm. for this broader discussion. And to have first Google map what they envision the future city to look like, I yeah. think, has, has evolved the conversation around what we can and, and should and should not be doing. But the pushback. Yeah. I mean, it's just tremendously helpful and, and to have that uh, dialogue open to to the citizens of, of Toronto, right. aware of those issues is, is remarkable. Um, we are at time. I'm a, a hardcore timekeeper. We have time after this to network. Um, and Susan will be here to answer some of your questions. Um, but thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you, Susan, again. Um, thank you all. Thank you for coming.